Hey Grandmasters, it's Mike from the WCA with the uh, Week 6 review. This is from our Spring 2012 semester. Uh, we took a look at uh, what's known as a win hour French defense, and that begins with the moves E4, E6, there's the French defense, D4, D5, Knight C3, and one of the ways that Black can continue here is to pin the Knight on C3 with the idea of possibly taking that knight at some point and breaking up the white pawn structure. Um, the main move in this position for white by far is the move e5, which closes the center and creates a big space advantage for white, which black would immediately try to break with the move c5. And let's just take a look at the main line for a couple of moves. a3, attacking the bishop. The bishop can retreat, but much more popular is to take on c3. White takes back, and there's advantages for both sides here. Uh, obviously, White's pawn structure has been damaged on the queen side, but Black uh, has given up their dark squared bishop. And if you look at the bishop that's left for Black, way up there on c8, you'll realize that it's going to take a while for that piece to get in the game. So what White will try to do is take advantage of the fact that those dark squares of White's have become weak, and maybe be able to fight on those squares um, and get something done before black can catch up in development. Black has lots of ideas here too as well. Um, mainly the pawn structure is in their favor, so a lot of these end games can be um, uh, really good for uh, black, especially if they can close that board up and uh, white's two bishops might not be able to move around the board so well. Um, there's also uh, some other plans here. Black, for example, the main line is 97 just developing Black kind of encourages white to go pawn hunting here. And this is actually the main line. If you look this up, you're going to see that the, this is the most popular way for white and black to play. Uh, and black just go, goes ahead and says, okay, take the pawn. And when you do, black will win a tempo with rook to g8. And this is really a wild position. Um, this is known as the poison pawn variation of the win hour. And the reason they call these opening variations poisoned um, it's like you go in with a piece, usually a queen, and you take a pawn or two. Like in this case, you can see the white queen can take the pawn on h7. Uh, but there's a, there's a downside to that. Um, the good point is you're picking up some material. I mean, a pawn, pawns are a pawn, um, and they can certainly be helpful uh, in the end game. However, um, it takes time to do this, and your queen can get uh, sometimes trapped in enemy territory, or you can just fall behind in development. As you can see here, every white piece is still on the back rank except for the queen, uh, which is being attacked by the rook. Um, so that's the main line in this position. Uh, the game that we examined, completely opposite. Um, it's considered to be one of the least popular moves, and that's from this position here. So instead of playing e5, um, white decides to exchange in the center. As some people call this an exchange win hour. Um, and it's followed up with the move queen f3 not popular for several reasons. Um, one, you're blocking your knight on g1, you're taking away that natural square. Uh, your queen is exposed, there's a, there's a chance that that queen could get attacked at some point and lose some more time. Uh, and there's also this annoying queen e7 check, which was played in the game. And um, white has to be a little careful here because getting out of this check is going to leave you um, with some something negative in the position. So, uh, for example, you don't want to trade queens here, you just move your queen out. If you block the check with your light squared bishop, the bishop is walking into a pin, and then the knight on g1 um, can only move to h3 at this point. Now, we're not showing you all of the squares that you're hearing about in the video, and this is an important part as we get into the last two weeks of the semester, uh, and especially before we head into the summer. Uh, all of the students are going to be advised in their study habits, and this is a very, very important point, um, that you have to start memorizing where these squares are. There's really two steps. The first step is just to learn the board, know where the letters and numbers are, so that if you're black or white and somebody throws out a random square like B4, um, you should know that it's on white side of the board and it's a dark square. Uh, many, many of our students are musicians, and once you get pretty good on a musical instrument, you should be able to play that instrument with your eyes closed. So as chess players, our chessboard 
is where we make our moves. So, you know, if you're a guitar player, then the frets or the neck of that guitar is where your fingers make your moves, and guitar players know where all those notes are. So if somebody tells them to play a B or a C or a chord or something like that, um, they don't always have to look down. They can pretty much know uh, where their hands are supposed to go. Part of your development as a chess player, you have to learn this board. Now, how to do that? There's a couple of tricks, and one that we recommend is whenever you solve a puzzle, the final move or two, say that square in your mind and stare at it. So, for example, if you checkmate someone on E7, and if you look up at the board, that's where the black queen is right now. So let's just pretend you've played a checkmate on E7. Um, stare at the board. Say, for example, queen takes E7 checkmate to yourself. And in time, if you keep repeating out loud and then looking at what you're, uh, where you're focused, you're going to start memorizing these squares. So the first uh, uh, progress you'll make is you might not find the exact square, but your eyes are going to start looking in the right direction. So when you hear B1 or B2, that 1 and 2 should automatically throw your eyes to the uh, white side of the board, and obviously a 7 or an 8 would be on the opposite side. So real important to start memorizing these uh, these squares. Now, another trick is when you set a position up for the first time, so let's say you're putting up a tactical position and there's 16 pieces on the board, 8 for white, 8 for black. Every time you put a piece down to set it up, say the squares out loud. And you know, you've just reinforced 16 different squares in your mind just doing one puzzle. It doesn't really take any time either. So if you do 10 or 15 puzzles, um, you're going to go over quite a few squares. So that would kind of complete step one, and that's just learning the board. Step two, once your rating starts going up, is you start visualizing the board, meaning you can turn your eyes away from the chessboard and start picking off those squares or putting squares together in your head without even sight of the board. And uh, someday that will even push you further and, and uh, so you can uh, play some blindfold chess. But for now, let's start really learning the squares. So as you go through the rest of this video, um, pay attention to the squares that are being called out and try to catch them. If it's going too fast, and it certainly will for some of you, pause the video. So if somebody calls out a square and you have no idea where it is, hit the pause button, find the square, click play and go back to work. Keep repeating it and you're going to make a lot of progress. Okay, so let's continue in the game. Uh, white was just checked, and white responds with knight g to e2, which seems a little funny because the light squared bishop gets blocked, uh, but uh, white is going to plan to break that pin at some point uh, with the move bishop e3, and there is a pin. Uh, if you look at the queen on e7, it just pinned the piece that uh, you blocked the check with, actually, so you, you more or less walked into a pin. Okay, so knight c6 which attacks the e-pawn. You have to remember that that pawn is uh, not protected. So white protects it with bishop e3, and that's starting to complete white's plan of castling queen side. Um, if you go back a move, uh, some kid, uh, one of the students pointed out in class, can white just take this pawn on d5? And the answer is they can. However, um, there is a move like knight f6, and white is going to lose some time here. And this game was played between two grandmasters, and it's very hard to do. It's very hard to grab a pawn in the middle of the board with your queen, give black really two moves, because when they play knight f6, you have to move your queen away, and then black's going to do something constructive like castle, and you, you have to make sure that you don't fall too far behind. Um, so uh, white is not uh, in any mood to grab that pawn. So after bishop e3, knight f6, uh, which creates a target on this square. So I highlighted the diagonal in the square for you, um, and you should see that right away. Uh, I remember Rusa saying in one of the lectures uh, to the class, you can't just look at knight f6 and say, okay, black is completing their development, getting re ready to castle uh, kingside. Can't do that. It's too short. You have to go deeper. And you have to see how the new move that your opponent played coordinates with the rest of his pieces. 
So the knight on f6 works really well with the bishop on c8, um, and that could lead to, say, bishop to g4, the highlighted square, and the queen would get hit and uh, lose more time. So white puts an end to that with pawn h3. And here, black makes a slight mistake. In the position, it was probably best for black to immediately take this knight, which would force the pawn to take, not the knight taking back. And uh, try to see why, if you can, so you can pause the video. So in this position, there's two ways to take back. You can take with the knight on e2, and you can take with the, uh, the pawn on b2. So pause it if you have to, but you should all see at some point that taking with the knight loses a pawn to knight takes d4. And you should pick up that pin that bishop on e3 can't help you out. So you lose the d4 pawn, and you're going to lose a tempo because your queen is attacked. So if uh, black had taken on c3 right away, that would have given uh, these doubled pawns then follow with knight to e4, which um, can create some problems. For example, if white were to castle queenside right now, um, a move like a5 seems very strange to play, but what that does is it, it's trying to bring the rook on a8 up into the game, and that's going to put some serious pressure on the king. You'll also notice that with the knight on e4, the white king cannot escape to the d2 square, uh, which means if things get a little hot on the queen side or if there's too much pressure, that king could get caught on the queen side of the board and possibly made it. The only way to challenge that knight would be to either move the queen and then play pawn f3. And I hope you guys are picking up these squares fast enough. If you keep working at it, you'll get better. Um, so if you move the queen, the question is, where does she go? There aren't many safe squares. Um, the only other way to challenge the knight would be to move your knight on e2, for example, with a move like knight g3. However, uh, that loses instantly. There is a forced mate in this position, so stop your uh, video if you need to, but there is a mate in three, and it begins with... Hopefully you've got your video turned back on. Queen a3, check. King b1, only move. Knight takes c3, check. King a1, only move. Mate in one. Queen takes a2. So in the position, after the move h3, it would have been a little easier uh, or put a little more pressure on white if black had taken right away with the move bishop takes c3. Instead, uh, black decided to play knight e4, which looks better on the surface because it's, um, you highlight here, you're attacking a pinned piece twice, which is something we're all taught to do. The only difference here is after knight to e4, um, white castles. And when white castles in this position, it allows the rook that just uh, transferred with the castle um, to protect the d-pawn. And in some of those lines that we looked at, um, that will prevent the knight on c6 from taking that pawn. Um, however, it, things are still not so clear. Um, the only difference is the white king has been sheltered. So what black tries to do is take that shelter away, takes on c3, knight takes, and they trade again on c3. And that leaves you with a position uh, with the white pawns shattered and the white king kind of left alone. Every single one of his pieces are to his right. So if black can get in on the queen side, uh, that king could be in trouble. But there's a big difference in this position. Um, there's not enough backup for uh, uh, the black pieces. You have to remember the two pieces that were most forward or most advanced into white's position have just been traded off. Um, so for example, if you try to attack with a move like queen a3, um, you will see that after king d2, for example, the white king is pretty safe. Uh, black's best is probably to just develop their last piece and uh, get on with things. Black may even be slightly better here. It's a pretty balanced position. Um, but going back, you might say, well, we can grab a pawn. 
Well, you can, uh, but this is like the poison, uh, poison pawn variation we showed you up here. This is from uh, the advanced win hour variation that we showed you, or the poison pawn. So just take a quick look at that queen up there, the white queen this time, and then uh, you'll see that uh, she could run out of squares very quickly. And then compare it to this position, uh, the main game, if black decides to go in there and grab that pawn. Well, what white will do is just develop their last piece, um, setting a trap. And the trap basically is, for example, if black, say, castles, um, the black queen is lost. And uh, again, if you need to pause the video, do it, but you can win the black queen in this position. And it's done first with the move rook a1, which leaves her uh, terribly short of squares. She either has to take that rook, or move to the only uh, open square, which is b2, and then you just bring up the rest of the forces, and the black queen has been uh, trapped. So that certainly didn't uh, happen in the game. So back to here, after those trades on c3, black decided to castle the king, which you have to remember a grandmaster is going to do. They're not going to go off and take pawns with their king stuck in the middle of the board. It's uh, much more prudent to um, take care of the king first. White develops, bishop to d3, great diagonal pointing at the black king. Black develops with bishop to e6, and then uh, a, a very typical attacking move that's designed to get black to move things near the king. And white plays the move queen h5. Now, obviously at this level, um, White knows that they're not going to checkmate the black king on h7, but they do know that black is going to respond by moving a pawn uh, near the king to stop the mate. In the game, uh, white decided to play the most aggressive pawn move with uh, f5. Uh, another choice would have been um, to play, for example, g6, which does the same thing. The only difference with g6 is, and I'll highlight those squares for you, it weakens um, all of the dark squares near the king. And uh, sometimes players are not comfortable doing that, especially with uh, white's dark square bishop and queen uh, pointing into that zone. So in the game, black decides to block with f5, but this allows white a chance to take away that defender and play the move g4. And g4 does two things. Uh, obviously, it's putting pressure on the pawn on f5, uh, which you cannot take. Um, but uh, also, if the pawn is traded at some point, it's going to open the G file. And if the G file opens, um, there will be, uh, you know, significant pressure coming in from the rooks. So here, black starts to go wrong and plays the move knight a5. Now, the idea is good. Obviously, they want to counterattack. The kings are castled on opposite sides of the board, so they want to push as much as they can against the white king as you're pushing against the black king but uh, it may have been wiser to set up something of a blockade. For example, with a move like g6. A move like g6 will push the queen back, so let's say to h6, and then black can actually leave that queen there because unless she gets help, you're not gonna be able to get in there and checkmate that king. So if the queen is leading the way, um, there's no threat to the rook on f8 in this position. So maybe you can continue with queen a3. Uh, if the king were to move somewhere, say to d2, now you have a typical unbalanced game, kings castled on opposite sides. You know, uh, they always use that expression, chances for both sides. But it is true, there are chances for both sides here. But it was important to play g6 first to kind of misplace the white queen. Uh, in the game continuation from this position, uh, black played knight a5, trying to bring that knight into position to attack right away. This allowed white to follow up with pawn takes, working on their plan. Black goes on with theirs, queen a3, check, and white puts the king in the center. Uh, you might think b1 is a safer square, but if you look at the location of the king now on d2, that king is pretty safe because he's surrounded by all those pawns and pieces. It's not going to be easy to break through. Uh, but now a very important moment, uh, knight c4 check. You have to be very careful about removing that knight. Uh, for example, if you were to play bishop takes c4, 
because there's an in-between move here. If you take that bishop, you would be hit by rook takes f5 first. So then after the queen moves out of the way, then they recover uh, the pawn. And this would become a totally different attacking formation. And there's a couple of keys here that you should notice, and this would be pretty good for black. Uh, one is here, the location of the kings. In this position, you still have chances to attack for both players because the kings are not on the same side of the board. You have one in the center and you have the other on the king side. So that would make it uh, an interesting attack. Another feature is the fact that the only minor piece left in the game is a bishop of opposite color. And we've explained this many times in the lectures. Um, when you have a bishop of opposite color in an attacking middle game, it usually favors the player who can get the attack going first because the other bishop is not going to be able to fight that piece. So if you examine this position closely, you're going to see that black has a little bit of an edge here. Uh, this would have turned out pretty good for him. So after the knight checks on c4, it was important that you don't give up your light squared bishop. And he plays king to e2. Now, in this position, uh, a normal move, bishop f7 trying to chase the queen away, queen dropped back to h4, and here uh, black chose to go after the wrong bishop. You can see right away that you can take on e3, which is in fact uh, what happened in the game. Black took on e3, white took back. But if you go back for a moment to this position, it was possible for black to try the move knight to b2, going after the light squared bishop. So. Uh, if you can grab that bishop, you might take some of the pressure off your king. Now, the reason for that is the light squared bishop is not protecting the white king as much as his dark squared bishop is. The dark squared bishop for white is covering the e file, and it's also pointing at the h6 square. If the light squared bishop is free, then the, that bishop is pointing at the h7 square. The h7 square is also attacked by the queen, which could lead to a checkmate, which is in fact what happens in the game. So for example, let me show you something after knight uh, to b2. What about rook h to g7? And if that knight were to take the rook, then you get hit with rook takes g7 check. Uh, the king has to take. He goes in the corner, he's made it in one move, and then when he's uh, exposed, pawn f6 check, and that opens up again the light squared bishop for uh, white, king back to g8, queen takes pawn, mate. Now this is exactly how the game finishes, the same pattern, but it was important uh, that black recognize here that white's light squared bishop uh, could really, really be a problem. Instead, he took the dark squared bishop. So when white takes back, now the pawn is covering the e-file. Black immediately tries to attack it, but he's too slow because here comes the same rook move that you saw before. And the difference between the two rooks, uh, well, it, it's the same on paper. The black rook is attacking a pawn directly in front of the white king, and in this position, the white rook is doing the same to black. The only difference is the white pieces are ready to follow up on the attack where the black pieces are not. So. Uh, Black ended up blundering in one move here and played the move queen e7, which um, to you guys, it should flash in your eyes. You should start picking up these patterns. Again, there's the move that was played in the game, and you should be trying to figure out why are we highlighting all those squares. It should look funny to you. Um, there's no room up there. There's no uh, uh, maneuvering ability for the black king, so there's a forced checkmate in this position. Um, no need to pause the video because we showed it to you earlier. Rook takes g7. King takes is forced because if you go to h8, we just take the pawn there with a checkmate. Um, kind of a cool checkmate. After the king took the rook, the same pawn move. Uh, the only difference here is that the white queen has an option of taking that pawn, but you would get made it on h7 just the same. Um, Okay, Grandmasters, uh, thanks for coming. We had a great class. We'll see you for week seven this Sunday.
do your work and, and remember the tips, training tips. When you're setting up puzzles, solving puzzles, start saying those squares out loud so that you get a good feel for the whole chessboard. Okay, see you Sunday.